the Jews want a place to worship on the Temple Mount. But the Arabs say, no, it's our Temple Mount. There never was a Jewish temple there in the first place, say the Palestinians. But there is a third party who wants the Temple Mount. Gary Stimmer is here to discuss with me today conspiracy over the Temple Mount. And J.R., there's good evidence that that third party is acting in collusion with the contestants, or at least uh, the Palestinians, uh, allowing the Palestinians to be the, the front rank, shall we say. Uh, the Palestinians currently are making ridiculous claims. Yasser Arafat, for example, was recently quoted as saying, quote, let it be clear the Wailing Wall is not a holy place of the Jews. It's an integral part of the mosque grounds, and we call it Al-Burak, the name of the horse with which uh, Mohammed ascended to heaven from Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, then when asked uh, recently about uh, whether Jerusalem wasn't indeed a holy place uh, to the Jews, he said, no, no, no. I'm quoting Yasser Arafat. No, allow me to be precise. They consider Hebron to be holier than Jerusalem. And uh, furthermore, uh, Yasser Arafat said this, until now all the excavations that have been carried out have failed to prove the location of the temple. It's 30 years since they captured the city and they have not succeeded in giving even one proof as to the location of the temple. And then he goes on to talk about the holy Al-Burak wall, which is the name of Mohammed's horse. And I can't help reflecting that uh, that is, uh, I think, probably an insult to name the Wailing Wall after Mohammed's horse. <laughs> <laughs> For 3,000 years, the Jews have laid claim to the Temple Mount. From the days of King Solomon when he built the magnificent temple there, reputed to be one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was destroyed, of course, in 587 B.C. by the Babylonians, and uh, 70 years or so later, its reconstruction began under Zerubbabel, Nehemiah. And uh, in the days of the first century, in the days of Herod the Great, uh, as he called himself, uh, he built a magnificent temple there. Jesus walked the halls of that temple and taught in Solomon's porch there. That temple was destroyed in A.D. 70. The history of the Temple Mount is a checkered one. There have been many groups wanting that Temple Mount. Daniel chapter 11, verse 45, the last verse of chapter 11, tells us, and he, that is the Antichrist, shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. There is a third party who wants that temple mount. On today's program, we hope to try to identify this third party, Gary. Well, the third party, and you know Jesus uh, picked up this same idea in Matthew 24 when he said, uh, 24, 15, he said, uh, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. We're talking about Judea here. This is, uh, there's no doubt about where Judea is. It's called the, the contested territories today. And there's no doubt about where the holy place is. The very good archaeological evidence is right up on top of that temple mount. Uh, I have here from The Guardian, actually it used to be called The Manchester Guardian, a news release from September 25th, uh, uh, and I quote, the government of Israel is strenuously promoting an idea once unthinkable and trusting Judaism's holiest site to United Nations control. The acting foreign minister Shlomo Ben-Ami leaves for Cairo today, now that was the 25th of September, the year 2000, where he is to sound out Egypt's president, Hosni Mubarak, on a proposal to transfer sovereignty of the Temple Mount, also called the Haram al-Sharif, uh, to the supervision of the five permanent members of the UN Security Council. Well, J.R., uh, that's uh, sinister news indeed. Let's go back for a few moments to A.D. 70 when the uh, Romans destroyed Jerusalem and burned Herod's temple to the ground. Um, the Jews continued to live in and around Jerusalem for the next uh, 70 years or so, 60 years. But in A.D. 132, Bar Kokhba uh, actually started a rebellion against the Romans uh, uh, once again. This, of course, was to be the last rebellion. 
The Romans handily won. The, uh, Bar Kokhba was killed, and in A.D. 132 to 135, the Romans under Hadrian, the general, deported the Jews to the slave markets of the world. And of course, from that day, uh, there were very few Jews, or oh, there were some, but very few who actually lived in the Holy Land. Uh, being a somewhat desolate land and the city of Jerusalem renamed Alia Capitolina so that the history of the Jews would be forever uh, lying oblivion, uh, in around the seventh century, Mohammed rose to power and uh, he came uh, across the Middle East and uh, with the sword converted the Middle East to uh, Islam, the Mohammedan religion. Mohammed, um, it is said, uh, some say came to Jerusalem, he was launched from the Temple Mount into heaven, all of that cannot be proven. Uh, the Quran has nothing whatsoever to say about it. Jerusalem is never mentioned in the Quran, uh, though uh, uh, Mecca and Medina are. And uh, the interesting thing about it is that in 691 A.D., the Mosque of Omar was built on the site of the ancient Jewish temple. That mosque still stands there to this day. 691. So the Arabs laid claim to the Temple Mount under the uh, Islamic religion in uh, the seventh century A.D. But in 1099, the Crusaders overran the Holy Land and drove out the infidels, as they were then called. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and of course, during those days, the Crusader Kingdom flourished. The Knights Templar were established. They are called the poor Knights of the Temple. Templar means temple, uh, French for temple. And uh, they effectively ruled for a couple of hundred years. The history there is most important because they appear to be the third party who want the Temple Mount today. And, and that third party, by the way, uh, has ancient roots. J.R. wrote uh, in 1989 a book called uh, Guardians of the Grail. Uh, let me just quote a, a little brief quotation here because we're talking about the 12th century, 13th century. Sometime between 1195 and 1216 A.D., Wolfram von Eschenbach published Parsifal, a poem about a quest for the Holy Grail. The poem was no ordinary work. Uh, Ravenscroft suggests that it is an initiation document of the highest order. It is a story of Percival, a young man who desired to become one of the knights of King Arthur's Round Table. Through a series of adventures, he was initiated to become the guardian of the Grail. Now, People have talked about the Grail, and the title of your book is The Guardians of the Grail, and people have envisioned it as the Cup of Christ, for example, but there's good evidence that it's, it's much more than that. Yes, you see, the Grail became a metaphor. It was symbolic. Nothing is what it seems to be. The Grail basically, in my opinion, was the Ark of the Covenant. So. Um, the Jews for 3,000 years have claimed uh, the Temple Mount. Uh, since the 7th century A.D., uh, the Muslims have claimed the Temple Mount. But for 1,000 years, from 1099 until today, I guess about 900 years, uh, the group called the Knights Templar have wanted the Temple Mount. Out of that has come the Masonic Lodge, and uh, they claim, you know, to be the Masons, the Stone Masons, who originally built the temple mm -hmm. for Solomon. They claim roots back to the Phoenician stonemasons, you they see, do. under Hiram. Yeah. And so the Masonic Lodge has a claim to the Temple Mount, and growing out of the Knights Templar were the Masonic Lodge. Then there was the Illuminati mm -hmm. around um, 1776, when Adam Weisop organized this secret society. Uh, then came Theosophy under Madame Blavatsky and the New Age movement. And these groups lay claim to the Temple Mount today. And of course, coming out of the Knights Templar was a, not only a religious order, mm -hmm. but a political order that still exists today. And uh, I think that is most important that we understand 
why some of the things are going on today. Because you see, I think, it is my opinion, that the Jews and the Palestinians are pawns in a game. And the one really behind it is the Knights Templar and the priori design, the French connection. Mm. We'll talk about that in just a few moments when we come back. This appears to be what's going on today. Um, we'll know more about it, of course, as time goes on. We'll be back in just a moment. Don't go away. The poem, Percival, is a story about the quest for the grail. As Gary said, Wolfram von Eschenbach uh, wrote the poem somewhere around the beginning of the 13th century from 1195 to 1216. And the poem then became a popular poem in, the, in medieval Europe. Um, Wolfram von Eschenbach uh, was uh, one of the Knights Templar. He, he was well aware of the Knights' quest for the grail, i.e. the Ark of the Covenant. And so in this poem, Percival, a knight of King Arthur's Round Table, goes off to India to find the Holy Grail. The Grail, of course, is called a stone of light in the poem. It is not a cup in the poem. And uh, to me, the stone of light has to do with the Ten Commandments engraved on the tables of stone in the Ark of the Covenant. And basically, that's where the power comes from that the Knights Templar wanted for if they could just possess that power, they could rule the world. And uh, so he tells the story of Percival who goes off to India. Now, any, uh, in medieval Europe, any country that bordered the Indian Ocean was called India, which included Ethiopia. He goes off to India and finds the ruler is named Prester John. Well, that just happens to be the title of the king of Ethiopia in the Middle Ages. And so obvious, obviously Ethiopia is the place. Why why were the Knights Templars interested in finding the grail in Ethiopia? Well, Gary, that takes us back to La Labella. Mm -hmm. The Prester John of Ethiopia was kicked out of his throne, and he went to Jerusalem, found a contingent of the Knights Templars. I think that was around 1175, 76 A.D. Mm -hmm. And he said, I was the king of Ethiopia, the Prester John of Ethiopia. My, my wicked brothers kicked me out of the country. If you'll get an army together and come back with me and overthrow my wicked brother and put me back on the throne, I want you to know we have the Ark of the Covenant down there. And so the Knights Templar go back, overthrow the brother, puts La Libella back upon the throne as Prester John of Ethiopia. And then a contingent of Knights Templar stay there for the next couple of hundred years. The reason why the Knights Templars were overthrown by the Pope and uh, by the French government, and, and uh, the Knights Templars were outlawed in uh, France um, uh, back in the uh, um, early 14th century, is because they were, um, they were after the Ark of the Covenant. And the, the Prester John of Ethiopia wrote a letter to the Pope, Pope Clement V, and uh, his friend, the uh, King of France at that time, telling them that, that the Knights Templars were sinister and that they had plans to capture the Ark and become rulers of the world. And so the Pope and his, um, his friend, the King of France, outlawed the Knights Templars, overran their castle in Paris, drove them out of Europe, uh, they thought, but of course they just went underground. They were a secret mm -hmm. society to begin with. Yeah. And this then shows the quest for the Ark of the Covenant and the plans for the Temple Mount and rebuilding the temple. And by the way, JR, there's very good historical evidence and archaeological evidence in Ethiopia. There uh, uh, are, are to be found there great artifacts carved by, uh, in the European style by stonemasons. Uh, who, who took years to do their work, and there are even the crosses of the Knights Templar to be found carved in stone, uh, done in the ancient past in Ethiopia. So the legend is not just uh, out of somebody's head. There's very good archaeological evidence that this happened, and the Knights Templar, uh, as J.R. mentioned, were forced underground. They were the, then, and they are now, a sort of combination of a, a, a political group, that is, they have political ends, but they also have an underlying 
uh, theosophy, if you will, a, a certain system of belief that stems from, from the dark, the occultic power. And, and when you combine those two, you have what the Bible describes as this ruling clan who will try to rule the world in the last days. They also have an economic base. During their years in Jerusalem, they dug up the, the treasure of Solomon's temple, took it back to Europe, and became the international banking cartel. The central banks of Europe and the world are owned by the Knights Templar. And so actually they have literally bought the world. And so they're the ones who are behind all of the uh, economic, uh, political malaise to create world government. The G7, for example, who has been meeting every year for the past 20-something years, um, every year they meet it is a closed session. Nobody is told what they're doing there. Basically, they are preparing for world government. Uh, Gary, Christopher Columbus seems to be in a part of this mix because he came to uh, Queen Isabella and told her that uh, he could find a new route to India. Well, that takes us back to the poem, mm -hmm. Percival. It does. In his quest for the grail. Um, when Christopher Columbus sailed west across the Atlantic looking for India, he actually took with him a contingent of Jews who spoke Hebrew, uh, hoping to find people on the other side who spoke Hebrew, and they wanted to find the Ark of the Covenant. Basically, I think that's what he was saying to Isabella. You send me west, I'll bring back the Ark of the Covenant. Mm -hmm. On his second trip over there, he took Ponce de Leon with him. Ponce de Leon traipsed all over Florida looking for the Fountain of Youth. Well, that's a part of the poem, Percival, in yes, the quest for the Holy Grail. So um, this big red uh, cross on the Santa Maria's um, um, sail shows us that he was a Knight Templar. Came right out of Portugal where the Knights Templars had, had fled for safety. Now, uh, J.R., as you know, there are many grail societies throughout the world, and they are connected uh, uh, un in an underground sort of way. Uh, the connections so sometimes defy examination. But there are many grail societies, which some say are really one grail society. It manifests itself in many ways. And they all have the same uh, goal, which is through division and conquering to take over, ultimately, the world. Now. Uh, and in just a very few seconds here, I'm going to take you back to what we, we mentioned the first of the program. Israel said the United Nations should take over the Temple Mount. That was on the 25th of September, 2000. Uh, three days later, Ehud Barak agreed that Jerusalem should have twin capitals. Uh, one day later, on September 29th, uh, Ariel Sharon said, over my dead body. Ariel Sharon recognized something. He recognized that the division of Jerusalem has its roots that go all the way back into Europe, really. And the power brokers of Europe who uh, really want to divide and conquer Jerusalem and take it. And the Bible, by the way, says that they will succeed uh, one dark day. I am, to <clears throat> I am told that in May of 1991, Shimon Peres uh, wrote a letter to the Pope. It was delivered by a Frenchman. And uh, this, of course, is a part of the French connection here of the Knights Templar, the Priori de Zion, promising the Vatican a hegemony over the holy places of Jerusalem and promising Yasser Arafat um, a sovereign capital in Jerusalem. And uh, they plan to divide up the Temple Mount. This has been in the mix, in the making, a conspiracy for it for some years now during the time, of course, of this peace accords uh, since 1991, 92, 93, uh -huh. the signing of the peace accord until this very day. Uh, a, a KGB agent is in uh, the Balkans, um, now a Christian, converted to Christ in the last few years, told his pastor, who related this to me personally just in the last few days, that the G7 has already planned who's going to be the president of the new world government and two vice presidents. I cannot verify this. I cannot confirm it. We must keep it in the realm of rumor. But he said, and he was an ex-KGB agent, that as in the KGB, he had privy to this 
information that the G7 have chosen Mikhail Gorbachev to be the president of the world government, the first vice president, Bill Clinton, and the second vice president, Margaret Thatcher. A lot of shenanigans going on behind the scenes, and uh, we know so little, Gary, of what's really going on, mm. and yet from time to time, little bits of information leak out. Watch Jerusalem. That's the key to the future. We'll be back in just a moment.